it's uh it's five o'clock and we're doing this live thing let me just make sure uh everything is all set looks like my audio is working looks like my video is working and uh and we're doing it how's it going uh, i'm john noise i'm uh if you don't know who i am i am one of the speakers and the outreach coordinator at stand to reason which is um, an amazing ministry and it's actually a little bit of a, a dream that i'd be uh, working with stands reason having this opportunity to come to you via a live uh, facebook uh, message on their facebook page and uh, if, if you're watching live I, I see the comments over on my left hand side and i think um yeah let me type in welcome just make sure it's all working and I would love to take questions that you might have. Uh, I'll try to get to them and uh, we'll go from there. But tonight I thought that I'd share something uh, kind of a little bit more personal with you guys. And uh, it's more of my kind of my journey, uh, what brought me here today to you guys and, and to, to Christ in general. And it's important to start at the beginning because I haven't always been like this. I uh, wasn't always a Christian. I actually didn't, I didn't grow up in the Christian church. I, gosh, man, my first memory of church, my first memory is my parents, they weren't, they weren't Christian by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, I grew up in, in Plymouth, Massachusetts and in the East, uh, Northeast, at least, it seems to be that, or maybe it was just my generation growing up. It seems to me that there was a little bit more of a an idea of um, cultural Catholicism is what I'll call it because I, I don't really have a better term than that for it. But, but everybody I knew was in some way, shape, or form or would have at least said that they were Catholic or Christian. And my parents, uh, they, they grew up Catholic, at least culturally. And, and, um, and when I say that, I mean that they just didn't, they didn't go to Catholic mass. We didn't go to Catholic mass every week, but it was important for some, some reason or another for my brother, at least I have an older brother and a younger sister. My older brother, he went, uh, to CCD Sun, uh, it's like Sunday school for those of you who don't know what that term means. And he went all the way up through his confirmation. So he did his first communion and his confirmation. Well, my parents wanted me to follow suit and I was going to Sunday school, CCD, and my, my this is the the only memory really I have from that time there is my last time actually ever going I was sitting in the class and and for whatever reason it was probably justified I wasn't the best kid growing up so it was justified I assume but I uh I remember being being walked out kind of led by the back of my neck by the collar by the priest and and he walks me out to the parking lot and and uh, my mother is pulling up around the same time around the cul-de-sac in the parking lot their driveway was a cul-de-sac and the priest very gently places me in the front seat of my my mom's uh, ford station wagon and um and i sit in there and the and the priest i forget his name even and he he poked his head in and said, Mrs. Noyes, uh, we would greatly appreciate it if you never brought your son back here again. And that was my first interaction, at least my first memory in my mind of, of the Christian faith. And, and I'm not going to say that that incident led me to the next uh, maybe uh, 20 years of my life, but it certainly left a, a flavor in my mouth uh, for organized religion as a whole, but Christianity, Catholicism in general. And, um, and, that, and that event led to other things and in worldview forming uh, relationships with people. And, uh, and ultimately in high school, I became an atheist. And I was a pretty um, vocal about my atheism in high school. I mean, it didn't come up that often, but in college, it most certainly did. And when I was in college, my atheism, I, I like to say it kind of it really bloomed. And uh, I, I came to believe that there was no God and... Um, and when I say, I just want to make sure that everybody knows that when I say, when I say I was an atheist, I would have adhered to, you know, the statement of, of like Carl, Carl Sagan, you know, the cosmos is all there is, all there ever was, or all there ever uh, will be. Um, and uh, everything that, that happens, happens by purely naturalistic processes. There's, 
certainly no such thing as a supernatural realm. Um, <clears throat> everything be, can be uh, explained and confined into uh, the physical universe around us. There was certainly nothing outside of that, no creator, no God, um, no soul, no um, immaterial mind. Um, and anyways, I'd, I'd like today to maybe uh, just take, I always say this, like 25 minutes to share some of my personal experiences with you and draw from those experiences with you. Because in a, in a very real way, I've been deconverted out of naturalism, out of atheism. And, 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 I, and this was done by allowing some of the evidence to really impact me and eventually lead me to Christianity. So as I was saying, I, I, was, uh, I was an atheist in, in college. And, uh, and then shortly thereafter, uh, I, I got my first job as, uh, as a paralegal at a fairly prestigious law firm in Washington, D.C. I worked on a lot of appellate cases, a lot of well-known cases, and it was, it was a lot of fun. It was very high-powered attorneys, and I was having a good time, and I fit right in, in, my, um, in with my naturalism, my atheism. I'm going to use those terms just so you guys know, materialism, naturalism, atheism, kind of interchangeably tonight, uh, understanding that, that, we, that there are distinctions to be made. But I think in the, in the broader sense, uh, this, the, we can use those terms interchangeably. So I was working at, at, at a law firm and, and then really, the, I mean, I explained some of my history there, but really my, my story begins um, as, as all good stories do with I, I met a girl, ultimately, Rihanna. She's now my wife. And I had this, this yearning to move to California from Washington, D.C., where I was living. And on my very first night in Washington, I mean, in Los Angeles, California, literally, I just arrived in the city. I think I was in town interviewing for jobs. I haven't even gotten a job and was moving there necessarily. It's had in my mind I wanted to get there. I went to a, a party and, and at that party at the person's apartment, uh, I was sitting out on the balcony and getting some fresh air. And uh, in walks the most amazing uh, girl that I've ever seen. And uh, she was wearing a red sweater, dark jeans. I remember she was wearing boots, high heel boots, black ones. And, and I loved her right away because she was just obnoxious in all the good ways. She was loud and fun. And, and she, she had this way, she still has it, this way of taking over a room when she enters into it. And she came in through the door and, and, and kind of took over. And I was kind of watching from the outside in, out on the patio, kind of by myself, just sitting there. And I hadn't met her before. And um, she wanted to meet me though. And, and, and she knew I was sitting on the patio. Somebody told her and she starts walking. She makes a beeline kind of right towards the patio and she walks straight into a screen door. Boom. She hits the screen door and, and she falls directly back on her bottom. And, and the, this is what really got me. The way she reacted was like, she'd done it a hundred times before. It was totally natural. She just flung her hair back and just let out the best laugh I've ever heard. It was the most, uh, the, the loudest, um, beautiful laugh I've ever heard. And right then and there, I knew, I knew that, that this was the girl for me. At least that's what I told myself. I'm not sure that she was there. It took a little bit of uh, <laughs> courting and wooing. And, uh, and, but as during that courting and wooing, we were getting to know each other. And um, our first Easter together, which is really interesting, um, faith, the issues of faith had never really come up in our conversation. At least she had never admitted to me or told me or, or brought up in my presence that she was a Christian. Well, on Easter, my older brother sent me an email mocking Jesus, mocking the cross, mocking heaven, mocking the whole idea of, uh, Hey, what's going on, Jason? What's going on, Philippe? Um, oh, Jason, man, congratulations. This is the, this is the, the, I guess one of the pitfalls, but also the benefits of doing a live uh, video is, uh, Jason Jenkins has a beautiful daughter who just got engaged, I think, um, I saw. So anyways, congratulations. Uh, praise the Lord. I will be praying for, for them. And uh, so, uh, in, in, so I'm in meeting my wife and getting to know her. I find out that she's a Christian through this email that my brother had sent. And I brought this email. I, I showed it. I remember printing it out because it was before. It was before these things. I hate to say that's how old I am. But um, it, 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 I printed it out and I remember showing it to her. And, and saying, isn't this funny? Isn't this so funny how they're mocking this Jesus? And she said, well, actually, um, I, this isn't funny because I'm a Christian. It's actually kind of offensive. And I remember, um, gosh, I remember thinking to myself, 
Wait a second. I thought that you were smart. Like you were, you're, you're a Christian. I can't believe this. Like I, I can't, I can't go out with a Christian because Christians are stupid. And I'm just being truthful with you guys. This is the way I used to think. I used to think that, that uh, Christians were just um, uh, numb or, or, or not dumb, but not certainly not intelligent or not thoughtful, I guess, is, is what I'm trying to say. And, and my wife is extremely intelligent. And, and when I was getting to know her, I, one of the things I loved most about her is, is that she's so smart. And then she tells, tells me that she's a Christian. I remember saying to her, like, do you really believe, do you really believe in Adam and Eve? Like, do you really believe that, that, that fairy tale? I can't believe, I thought that you were smart. And then, and then, or I'd, I'd hit her up about evolution all the time. I'd say, wait a second, you're telling me that you don't believe in, 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 in like the neo-Darwinian synthesis. You're telling me that you don't believe in common descent, natural selection, random mutation. I'd say, you don't believe these things. And, 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 and that was so odd to me. It was so weird that, that, and that somebody so smart could believe these foolish things. Then we got to know each other. And I used to bring these things up all the time to her and berate her. And if you asked her, if she was here right now, I mean, I could probably bring her in, but she wouldn't like that very much. Um, but, but she used to say that she used to go home uh, from our dates crying because number one, I wasn't the Christian. So she knew ultimately the relationship wasn't going to go anywhere. But also number two, I was an atheist and, and I, and, and, and I mocked her faith. And, and um, number three though, she would also say that she, she never really could give me a good answer. And, and one of the things that I'd really like to do tonight is kind of address that issue because I think oftentimes when we are trying as Christians, this is kind of an aside to my story, when we're, try, when, when, when we're trying as Christians to deal with naturalism or atheism or materialism, oftentimes it's, it's daunting. It's a daunting task. I think sometimes we can, we can psych ourselves out. Um, thinking we don't have uh, enough information, we don't know enough, or or somehow the atheist is smarter than us. Or, um, I mean, I understand this 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 thinking. I, I think uh, I understand it because entire cultures have been indoctrinated with this type of thinking. I think entire doctrine, and in the largest extent, the United States. I think we can fall into that category thinking uh, naturalistically. You know. Um, you know, I was certainly, I would have said I was indoctrinated into naturalism. Nobody introduced Christianity to me, yet uh, all the time, tenets of naturalism were being introduced. I, mean, I didn't know I was being taught naturalism in, in elementary school, middle school, high school, and college, but I certainly was. And and uh, this is the view, naturalism is the view that most universities hold in this country, certainly. Uh, there's little to no debate about that. Um so with, with these things in mind, sometimes I think that we think when we have to address the issue of naturalism or atheism, it, it, it's a daunting task and we can understand why. But um, I also want to say that in certain circles, naturalism, uh, it, it can be a tough nut to crack. You know, but, but I think that there's an upside when we try to address naturalism because a lot of atheists, just like me, uh, when I was an atheist, I thought uh, Christianity in the end was intellectually bankrupt. That's what I believe. And um, I think that in part, this is due to a, a, a misunderstanding or a, a wrong definition of faith. You know, uh, faith, uh, there's, a, there's a book out there, Manual for Creating Atheists, written by Peter Bogosian. And, and in it, he defines faith as pretending to know uh, things that you don't know. And that's not what I mean when I say faith. Um, so, so anyways, um, like I said, this was true of me. I used to think Christian Christianity and Christians were intellectually bankrupt. I thought they were, I thought they were stupid, um, believing falsities. And, but I think that in, in, in reality, this actually is an ally to us. Um, because I think when we're able to offer robust answers to the atheists objections, when we're able to put a stone in their shoe, I think we cause them to pause and say, whoa, and this is what happened to me. And we're going to get to that. We're going to say, whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't think that there were answers to my problems. You see, I used to believe that because I used to press into my Christian friends. Like we'd go out for coffee or for dinner and I'd be talking to them. And, and I, I, would, I would say things like, wait a second, you believe the, the Bible to be true. How can you believe the Bible to be true? Don't you know that it's been copied over and over and over again. Don't you know, and, and Bart Ehrman, uh, I would have said this, Bart Ehrman, who is uh, the largely considered one of the uh, 
preeminent, one of the best New Testament critical scholars on the planet, says that there are more textual variances in the New Testament than there are words in the New Testament. And that's a true statement. And I bring these things up or say, don't you know about, you know, evolution? Don't you know about the 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 vestigial or, uh, you know, tales that, that we once had, the features of our body that, that indicate that we are evolved? Don't you know this stuff to be true? And when, when, and when I bring this up to my Christian friends, they could never give me an answer. Ever. If anything, they just get frustrated with me. And and largely uh, that's due to my tone and, and, and I'm, I'm a direct kind of guy, but um, they would get frustrated uh, with me or, or they would get frustrated that they didn't have any answers. And then uh, getting out of this aside, you know, fast forwarding kind of to meeting Rihanna and getting to know her a little bit more. And eventually she wanted to uh, she wanted to start going back to church. You see, Rihanna had stopped going to church for a time. And, and right around the time I met her, she was starting to take her faith more seriously. And uh, she asked me one day <laughs> if I'd go to church with her as an atheist. And and I've done crazier things for the affections of a woman. So I said, absolutely. I, I will go to church with you uh, as long as I get to spend time with you, whatever. So we went to a church, a little teeny tiny church. Well, I guess it's not little, uh, you know, a couple hundred people in uh, Studio City. And I remember my first time going like it, like it was yesterday. And, and I thought it was the weirdest place on the planet. You know, um, uh, I remember a woman over in the corner spinning during the songs. And, and, and I remember people speaking in tongues during the songs. And I remember uh, it kind of at first glance uh, confirming everything I thought about Christianity. Uh, it was it was just not for me. And um and uh, so, so I started going with her and then every weekend she wanted to go. So every weekend I'd go with her and eventually she wanted to become a member of this church. And in order to become a member, you got to take uh, these classes on Saturdays. And so I used to go with her to those. And, and I used to go and I used to press in and I was met with the same thing, kind of blank stares. Uh, when I'd ask hard questions, they wouldn't quite know what to, to do with me. But, but the, uh, two things stick in my mind. Uh, one is that they were real people. They were uh, super nice people. Um, and they were genuinely interested in me. They weren't fake, in other words. And, uh, and I really appreciated that. And they wanted to get to know me and they weren't trying to convert me. You know, they, uh, well, I don't know why actually they didn't want to convert me. I think maybe I was intimidating um, the way that would bring stuff up. And, and our, I'd, I'd love to argue, so I'd, I'd, I'd bring arguments to them. Um, but it always stuck out how, how genuine they were and how nice they were to me and uh, welcoming you know, and, and always asking about me and wanting to get to know me, which was fantastic. And part of this class that Rihanna had to go to to become a member involved getting a private meeting with uh, the pastor and his wife. And I went to that meeting and I, when I went to that meeting, dude, I had like a stack, I'm looking for like a clipboard or something, but I had like a stack of papers with me because I wanted to debate this, uh, this, this pastor and I wanted to convert him. Like I had it in my mind that, uh, that I was going to have a conversation with this man and, and I was just going to rip his faith from him. And I was going to rip his worldview from him and, and, and convert him to the truth right then and there. Well, that didn't happen. Uh, we had a long conversation and, uh, a lot of answers. He, he, he answered, you know, that's a good question. I have no idea how to answer that. Uh, some of them he offered me answers to, which were, which were pretty good. Um, but in the most important thing is, is during that whole co- meeting, it lasted about maybe a couple hours, is he was, he was very honest. Uh, Pastor Dave was very, very honest with me, which I really, again, I just really appreciated that and kind of started breaking the mold a little bit of, of who I knew as Christians. He wasn't trying to convert me again. He wasn't really even trying to argue with me. He was just trying to answer my questions the best he could. And, uh, and I threw everything I had at him. And at the end of the evening, they, they got up and, and my wife was, or she's not my wife at the time, but Rihanna was there and, and they offered her membership. And, and then he came over and shook my hand. He said, you know what, John, we have enough members right now. We don't want you in this church. You don't aren't a believer. Feel free to come. You're always welcome, but we don't want you as a member. And, and I actually really, really appreciated that too, because again, he was being honest. If he had said, hey, John, we'd love for you to join the church. I'd be like, dude, you just want my money. You just want, uh, you just want numbers like butts in the seats, bucks in the coffers. You're totally, it would have been a confirmation, another confirmation of what I believe to be true about Christians. And, and that just, uh, it, it, the, the experience was just perfect. And, and the best part about this whole night, the best part about this whole night, and what really led to um, the beginning of something for me is 
he turned me around as he was shaking my hand. He turned me around to his bookshelf and off of his bookshelf. And I tried to find it right before I came on right now, but I can't. He gave me a copy of Can Man Live Without God by Ravi Zacharias. And he handed it to me. He said, you know what, John, you might find something in here. And I, I looked at it. This guy, Ravi Zacharias, never heard of it. Um, never heard of him. Went home and I started reading. And I must have read that book gosh, five times over and over and over again. And what I found in that book for the first time, I found some, some answers um, to my intellectual questions. I found some, uh, something that I didn't think existed. You know, I used to think Christians were dumb and this man was obviously not dumb and he was very clearly a Christian. And I found reasons for why he believed what he believed. And not only that, but he expressed himself in a way that was really palpable to me. And then around that same time, my future in-laws, they gave me um, uh, a New Believers Bible. I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about. It's the one that's edited by Greg Laurie. It's the NLT, NLT translation. And it has cornerstones and, and who is Jesus and who is the devil and what is hell and who is God and where is God. And it answers all these basic fundamental questions for you. And I read that. I read that Bible from Genesis to Revelation over the course of three months, cover to cover. And it was really in that direct encounter with the word of God. It was really in my interaction with the scriptures that really the floodgates got opened for me. And once that happened, and, and, and this is where really the meat of what I want to talk to you about uh, comes in. Once that happened, I realized that my worldview of atheism, which I thought so, lined up with reality perfectly. And when I say lined up with reality I mean, it lined up, it best explained the way the world really is. That's reality, the way the world really is. And if you have a worldview, everybody has a worldview, and, 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 and that worldview seeks to explain this world. And if you have a worldview that's robust, it should have explanatory power, meaning it should be able to explain the things around us. And I thought my atheism, my naturalism, the name for the worldview, my naturalism could do that. And as I interacted with the word of God, and as I interacted with Rabbi Zacharias, and actually interestingly enough, Greg Kokel and Jay Warner Wallace, when he was on, when his ministry was Please Convince Me, um, when I interacted with some of these guys, Gary Habermas, through their writing, Greg through his reading, um, Jay, uh, uh, Greg through his radio show rather, Jay Warner Wallace through his podcast. I remember um, things being pointed out to me where I, and, and, and Greg always used the term uh, bumping into reality. And this describes this perfectly because, uh, man, I'd start bumping into reality, meaning, meaning I would, I would be living life according to the way the world really is. Cause we all have to live in this world. So, so we all have to live in the same world according to the same reality. And as I'm living this way and I'm, I'm, I'm walking around the world, I'm navigating relationships and work and job and, and, and philosophy and theology. I'm trying to navigate all these things. I start bumping into things. And tonight I just want to briefly mention with our short time that we have left together, three things that uh, when I bumped into them to this day, uh, they stick out in my mind as really causing me pause. And the first one is, is, is what we call the bump of stuff. Uh, it's, it's the bump of stuff. Why does everything exist? I mean, I remember as a, as a little boy in Plymouth, Massachusetts, laying on my front lawn, looking up at the stars in the sky and wondering, where does this all come from? How did it all get here? You know, why is there something rather than nothing? What caused the beginning of everything? You know, and as I got older and started learning, you know, uh, more sophisticated things, I, I learned that everything that begins to exist needs to come from somewhere. It has to come from somewhere. There has to be a beginning to anything that has a beginning. And I'd wrestle with this stuff. And, and, and my atheism would have just said everything started at the Big Bang. Uh, there was a singularity. And then uh, I'd lean into, you know, Lawrence Krauss and and in his definition of nothing, you know, well, it was a quantum vacuum and a, and a blip and boom, all of a sudden. But then as I started looking into this stuff, it didn't, it, that didn't work. It didn't, uh, it didn't, it didn't line up with reality, you know, and, and, and these big holy cow, I call them the holy cow questions of life. 
weren't being answered by my naturalism. It wasn't included in my worldview. My worldview couldn't shoulder the weight of them, you know, and, and, and as a process, as a, as a, I guess, a product of me going through this process, testing my, my naturalism, according to reality, I realized that I had to kind of question my naturalism. So I started dropping my presuppositions uh, that, that, that I had forever, you know, and, and uh, trying to follow the evidence where it, where it leads me, you know, and, and, you know, I ask myself and I, and I ask atheists and I ask my atheist friends, my family that don't believe in God, I ask them these questions all the time. Like if you're talking to an atheist, you know, do things exist? Well, of course they exist. Things exist everywhere, you know, um, do things that exist, uh, have, have they always existed? You know, and then I remember thinking this through and it took me a little bit longer to come to this process, but no, everything that I interact with, at least that exists, you know, this, this paper here, uh, this is a prayer I wrote out, um, you know, this, this keyboard, uh, you know, this, this book, you know, um, they haven't always existed. They had a, a beginning, you know? So no, no, no. The things that exist haven't always existed. And then I got to thinking to myself, well, what caused them to exist? And in my mind, there was just silence, you know? Um, and then when I started thinking about, well, books have authors. So, I mean, this is Kent Hughes. He wrote this book and then, then it's published by um, Crossway. So, I mean, I know where the genesis of this is. I, I know that this prayer, this is a prayer that I wrote out for Easter service for the church. I started a few months back. And so I know that this, this came from, from me and my mind, which we're going to get to that problem in a couple minutes. And I started, and then, and then you get to the bigger stuff. Okay. Well, where'd this house come from? Well, builders and contractors and ultimately lumber and trees and, and all this stuff. Well, where'd the earth come from? Well, we have theories for that, right? Whatever it might be. We, you know, uh, well, let's go bigger. Where'd the universe come from? You know, where'd, where'd that come from? Well, that's interesting because the universe is here and exists. But when you come to that stage as a, for me, at least as a naturalist, it was a big bump. I couldn't answer it. Where'd that come from? You know, put me in a really odd uh, place because I don't want to say something caused the universe because uh, the minute I, I, I said something caused the, the universe, it, that means uh, my naturalism has to be dead because according to naturalism, a basic tenet of that is it's a closed system. So like everything that, that causes anything has to be included in the system. But now we're talking about thinking outside of the system. We're thinking about the universe. Where'd that all come from? All matter, space, and time. It has to be something by definition. If it had a cause, if I answered, well, it came from somewhere, uh, if, I, if it's something had this cause, then then it has to be something that's timeless, matterless. Um, you know, uh, it, ha it has to be a, a non-physical, eternal being. Well, that sounds to me an awful like like God. And, and as a naturalist, I didn't want to say that. But then um, if I said, uh, you know, it didn't come from, you know, it came from nothing. I mean, to me, that just seems kind of beyond reason. Um you know, and, and that's where this big bump of stuff comes in. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to argue right now. I'm not going to argue the impossibility of getting something from nothing. Um, because, but, because I think that when we're talking to ourselves or wrestling with these things on our own, you know, if we're talking to our atheistic friends, our naturalistic friends, our friends or family who don't believe in God, oftentimes um, I did this as an atheist. I trade on reason. I'd say that I'm the reasonable one. Well, then I just say, well, what's more reasonable? Everything coming from nothing or coming from something? You know, what, are the, what, are, what are the chances? You know, um, I, I, th I think of it like this. Like, like what are the chances of if, 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 uh, if I'm driving home from work and, and, I, and I pull into my driveway and I open the garage door and in my, in my garage is a brand new uh, Tesla X. And it's got one of those huge carbos on it. It's got huge red a red bow and it's black and it's beautiful. And it's brand new. And it's got a big gift tag on it. It says to John 
And I go inside and my wife is there and she's uh, standing at the kitchen, probably on her computer doing some work or, or t- trying to help with the kids or something. And I say, hey, babe, like, where'd the Tesla come from? It's amazing. And she just go, yeah, I know. It just came into existence, just popped into existence. It's just been there, you know, and now, boom, it's there. You know, it's like crazy. That that's happens all the time. No, that's, a- <coughs> excuse me, that stuff doesn't ever happen. Things don't come into existence out of nowhere. They just don't. If the world was like that, if the world was really like that, we would uh, we would be in some hot water because you'd be driving down the freeway going 65, 75 miles an hour, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, boom, right in front of you, a cow would pop into existence. Well, there goes your brand new Tesla X, you know, there goes the cow, certainly. What a mess. You know, and then I, and I started thinking about this stuff, you know, um... If, if, if what I was believing about the universe in order to sustain my naturalism was true, that everything came from nothing, it just came from some, like from, from nowhere, then, then the thing I relied on most in my worldview to explain the world around me, science was, was useless. It's because science would be impossible. You can't make observations like this. You can't, you can't like look in the beaker if, if things just pop into existence or you're looking through the microscope, uh, things would just like, they just change on you. I started thinking about this stuff and I know it sounds really simplistic, but I think that's kind of the point. It doesn't need to be complicated. You know, cause, cause it, 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 oftentimes as an, as an atheist, I would have said like a Christian, I'd say, well, you just believe in magic, you know, you believe in magic. And, and then what happened is, is during this bump into stuff, I became to, I came to think that actually my, my worldview was actually the one that was worse than magic because at least in, 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 in magic, you have a guy pulling a rabbit out of a hat. You know, but but on on naturalism, you you have no hat, and and then there's no magician, and it's just like it's just like a rabbit, the universe, a rabbit pff, just appearing out of nowhere. You know, and as I'm talking, I know that you guys, if you guys follow Stand to Reason, most likely you're probably uh, an apologetics junkie like I am, and you and you're recognizing this as the Kalam cosmological argument. Um. And, and I've heard it summed up this way. Greg likes to say, and I've heard multiple people say, a, a, a big bang needs a big banger. You know, it, it, and that pretty much just covers it, you know. And, and um, like all the time when we, and this is, this is why I talk about a bump, into, a, a bump into reality. This is what I mean. I had a bump in the stuff. This is my bump in the reality. All the time we know when we hear something or see something, we assume it came from somewhere. Last year. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm walking through Disneyland. So actually, we're, we're in Disneyland and we're about to go on Mater's like crazy ride thing. And we're standing in line and we park the stroller and I've got four little girls. So we have, uh, we always have a stroller with us and um, we're standing in line. And then I heard bang, bang, like that. And, and, and everybody, they turn and they look in the same direction. Everybody is looking at the sa- towards the same thing. You know, everybody, nobody's like, oh, that bang just came from nowhere. No, everybody's trying to figure out where that bang came from, those two bangs. Well, as it turns out, <coughs> excuse me, as it turns out, uh, those two bangs were actually my stroller wheels popping. You see, before I left that morning, I inflated my my uh, my wheels. We have one of those Bob strollers, and I, I misread the PSI, and I too much I put too much air in it, and when the sun beat down, they, they they got hot and they burst the tires on us. The point is is that the, that the bangs those the, the succession the succession of bangs came from somewhere and everybody there the hundreds of people if not thousands of people uh, within hearing distance all of them looked for where that sound originated. Not one of them just kind of carried about and was like oh another bang from nowhere. Well, it's the same thing with, with stuff. It's the same thing with the universe. You know, it has to come from somewhere. And, and then as I was walking from, from atheism to Christianity, as I was walking from naturalism to Christianity, this bump, this was really disturbing me. This was, this was something I was wrestling with. And in the end, my naturalism uh, couldn't answer these big holy cow questions. You know, it fell short. You know, naturalism cannot explain where stuff comes from, but Christian theism can. You see, but it's not only that, it, it, it does so, uh, Christianity that is, Christianity uh, explains these things in a way that's 
consistent with our basic intuitions about reality as they are. You see, the, the explanation that Christian theism offers here lines up perfectly with the way things really are. And once the, the presuppositions of my naturalism, once the, the naturalistic presupposition was, was dropped, uh, there was no, really nowhere else to turn. You know, all, all effects have to have uh, causes adequate uh, to explain them. You know, what made the Big Bang? What caused, you know, the, the, the bang in the, in, the, in, the, in the amusement park? And in the case of the universe, it's no different. What caused the Big Bang? Who's the big banger? You know, as I said before, it has to be, it has to, the big banger has to look like something. It has to be, you know, all powerful, timeless, spaceless, unembodied mind. I mean, you can, you can call it, friends, you can call it whatever you want. The atheist can even call it whatever they want, but in the end, it's God. You know, and atheism just has no explanation. And, 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 and as an atheist, I might've said nothing, nothing doesn't cut it. It just doesn't cut it in this because there's a, there is an alternative explanation that's better than nothing. And that's God. And when the atheist, and then I know this from experience, when the atheist doesn't want to go there, it's because they're allowing their presuppositions to guide the conversation, to guide their thought process. They're not allowed to go there because there's not room for it in their worldview. Well, maybe they need to revisit their worldview. I did. And when I dropped those presuppositions, when I dropped the presupposition of naturalism, I was left with, with some brand of theism, you know, um, and then start to think about this. This is a bigger holy cow. Oh my gosh. Well, if, if, uh, if, if, if God caused the big bang, then, then that means miracles are possible in this world. And that's a, that's a whole nother bump. Um, maybe for, maybe for another time. Uh, oh my gosh. See, this always happens. You know, I say, oh, I'm going to go on for 30 minutes. I tell my wife, Hey, I'll be in my office. Well, this is my office slash playroom. I'll be in there for 30 minutes and it turns out to be an hour. That's, that's the, that's, that's one of the major bumps right there. The bump of stuff. My, my atheism just couldn't, couldn't explain where everything or, originated, you know, <coughs> excuse me. I'm sorry. I have an itch. I didn't bring any water in here. Um, so the bump of stuff. The next bump is, is, is one that, uh, as an atheist, <laughs> I used to bring up all the time when debating uh, my Christian counterparts, when debating my Christian friends. I would bring this up all the time. It was it was my coup de grace. It was my nail in God's coffin, is what I would call it. It was my go-to argument to shut the Christian down. Um, it was it was the one I raised most frequently, easily. It was. Um, for sure the most durable as far as when I brought it up to my friends. Um, and it was in, in reality, I think it's probably the most durable in many ways as it stands. And it's, uh, it's, it's oftentimes in, in reality, I think it is the most difficult objection to, to theism. And that's the problem of evil. And I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this because I think I've already done a live on the problem of evil itself. Um, but this is what I used to bring up all, all the time. You know, um, and it wasn't my only like go to argument against God's existence, though. You know, it's it's uh, it, it's the reason why I, I really enjoy talking about this topic so much is because this is a part of reality that that I, I also as an atheist and a Christian, <coughs> excuse me, I, I mean, I bump into it all the time. It's part of our, our the, the more it's part of the world around us. It's part of uh, living in this world and everybody, regardless of our worldview has to experience it, but not every worldview is equal in explaining it. Um, and, and I, I like to call this one, the, the, it's not just the, you know, um, the problem of evil, but I, I call it a bump of bad. I bumped into this all the time. And I have to tell you, if I'm just being honest with you tonight, um, and I'm just going to do an overview here of this one to cut down on time, but this was probably one of the most significant things uh, that helped me see that my naturalism was false and more than that Christianity was true. And I'm going to say right up front, the reason why, and we might, I might say this again, 
depending on how in depth I get. But the reason why is because not only could my atheism not account for the existence of evil, even if it could, there was no solution. Whereas Christianity, the Christian worldview, not only contains an explanation for evil and where it comes from, but it also gives us a solution, Jesus. You know, um, let me give you a, let me give you an example. Uh, I want to give you an example of how maybe do something a little bit different because I've already explained the problem of evil in another video. I'd love to talk to you just about how we can show or turn uh, the problem of evil actually into an advantage for Christianity based upon what I just said, how we have not only an explanation for it, but also the solution. Um, this is the way I do it <clears throat> first. And I kind of actually mentioned this last night, if you guys were watching the book club uh, on tactics, but um, what, what all you got to do is when you're talking to somebody who denies the, the existence, if you're talking to a naturalistic friend, uh, an atheistic friend, a materialistic friend, all you got to do is, is uh, dream up the most morally grotesque thing uh, that, that, that uh, you can imagine. Okay. Often um, you might not even have to bring anything up. The, the atheist might, might do it for you because, because as I said before, he's bumping into it. She's bumping into it all the time anyway. You know, um, we, the most popular one to bring up is usually like the Holocaust or, you know, Auschwitz, which I had the, the, I want to say the privilege, but I don't know if it's necessarily the privilege. I had the opportunity to visit Auschwitz a couple of years back when I was in Poland teaching some apologetics in Germany. And it was such a interesting experience. I, 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 I we don't have time to digress onto that, but um, you know, this is these are the things I'll bring up. And now it's now it's even more. It hits even more home for me because I've been there and I've experienced in at least a, a, a certain way the evil that Auschwitz brought to the world. Um, and then, and if they're not receptive to Auschwitz or something like that, you can always bring up you know sexual slavery, global warming. Uh, you know, secondhand smoke, gay bashing, like whatever it is, you know, you can pick your poison, pick their poison. Um, you know, basically what you want to do is, 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 is you want to, you want to push their uh, moral hot buttons ultimately is what you're trying to do. <clears throat> and once you get that button pushed, you know, uh, ask the question, like, what do you make of it? You know, what, what's your assessment of this certain thing? You know, what's this, you know, so the Holocaust, like, what do you think about that? You know, well, that ain't right. You know, what do you think of slavery? Well, it's not good. These these things they're wrong. They're 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 wrong and they're wicked and they're bad and they're evil and and it's not the way it's supposed to be. Is often uh, the words that people use. And then if once that once you get that, it's not the way things are supposed to be. I ask a clarifying question, you know, I, I just ask them, well, are you describing the actions themselves or are you describing your emotion towards the action? So is Auschwitz bad because it makes you feel bad or is Auschwitz, what happened at Auschwitz bad because of what happened at Auschwitz? And, um, you know, or, or I'll try to ask a clarifying question because, you know, maybe, maybe it's your, your cultural point of view, your culture itself or our culture condemns that way but it's not necessarily wrong, you know, and, and basically what I'm doing, you guys probably recognize this is I'm trying to distinguish between an objective moral standard and a relative uh, moral standard. And um, it's basically, you know, uh, morality on the outside somewhere out here, or is it just morality on the inside somewhere in here, personal preference and opinion, or is there something objective out there that makes a certain action wrong? Uh, because I think that this is really important and when I, when I realized this, when, when I realized the difference in this and in the way that reality really is, I experienced a major, a major point of contention in my worldview. Um, my naturalism, my atheism could not, uh, didn't, I didn't know what to do with this, to be honest with you. And I, and I really struggled with it because I was chasing my atheism hard. I mean, I was like trying to live my atheism out according to, uh, well, 
I was trying, I was trying to be the best atheist I could and live by the moral standards that atheism gave me. And, and, and in the end it's might makes right. And I'm a pretty big guy and, and I like to have fun and I was making good money. I was chasing the wrong things and, and it led to dark places really fast. I'm just, I'm just giving you my personal experience there. I'm not expecting that to be an argument against naturalism. It's just my experience. But the thing is, is, is at the end of the night, at the end of the day, at the end of my experiences, I knew what I was doing was wrong. But when I tried to put a worldview to that, my worldview to that, um, things started to really, really go south fast. Um, I couldn't, I, I had no category for the way that I felt. Um, you see, the problem of evil, the, pro the, the problem of evil requires an objective morality. This means in order for, for someone to even bring up the problem, in order for somebody to even bring it up to you, you have to appeal to an objective standard outside of ourselves. Evil is out there in some sense. Uh, the existence of evil, it needs to be, um, it needs to be a detail of the external world out there and, and independent of you and me. You know, some things, you know, some things just necessarily are wicked in and of themselves, regardless of someone's personal opinion. Hitler did not think what he was doing was wicked, but it was, you see. Um, and then this is, I think, a, a key point to, to kind of get. This is a key point for me when I was transitioning, when I was going from, from atheism to Christianity. Uh, if, if, if relativism is true, then there is no problem of evil. And, and ultimately, atheism, materialism, ultimately is, is a system of relativism. And it relies on relativism, you know, because it's all just basically personal preference. That's where atheism ends. <clears throat> that's, what, that's what's available to the atheist when you're talking about morality. You know, um, because on, on that view, on the atheistic view, that worldview, transcendent, objective, moral obligations, they're just fictions. They're made up. Behaviors can be uh, distasteful. You, you know, individuals can dislike what you're doing. They can be taboo, meaning, meaning uh, cultures uh, forbid them. But they can't be, they can't be wrong in any, any ultimate sense of the word wrong. They can't be evil. You know, um, yeah, let me bring up, uh, I'm trying to sum this up in a way that's, that's really good. Okay. It's, it's, it, it. okay. On the Autobahn, right? So, so it's keeping with Germany on the Autobahn. Can you speed? Well, no, no, you can't, you can't speed. Well, why not? Well, because there's no speed limit, you can't break a law that that doesn't exist. In relativism, um, there are no outside laws, and that that applies to morality as well. So you can't break the law that's not there. Just like you can't speed on the autobahn, so you can't have evil in the world. Just like you can't break the law on the autobahn of speeding, if that makes sense. Um, uh, going a step further. You know, um, let's say, let's, let's leave Germany. Okay, so you're no longer in Germany, but you're on a perfectly flat um, territory of land in, in no country at all. There is no one who claims this portion of land, but it's completely fat, flat as far, as far as the eye can see. Um, can, you, can you break the speed limit there? Well, no. <laughs> well, why not? Well, because there's no speed limit. Well, why? Because there's no government. You see, laws require lawmakers if that makes sense. If you're in the middle of nowhere on land claimed by no government, there's no speed limit because there's nobody to give the, the speed to set the speed limit. That means you, you can't break a speed limit that doesn't exist. Transcendent laws, you see, are, are the same way. Transcendent laws require a transcendent lawmaker. If there's no governing authority over the universe, how can there be any universal speed limit, so to speak, to say in our motif? But how can there be any universal laws that, that apply uh, equally to everyone? There can't. So in, in reality, when I would look at the world and, and even my own life as an atheist, and I'd say that's wrong, th there was a major bump for me. And, and many of you guys, I know you guys are probably recognizing this as, as the moral argument for the existence of God. Um, I know that. Uh, but, but this is just another way of putting it. Um, 
back to kind of you know how we can illustrate this and how I illustrate this uh, in uh, conversations with people. I'm trying to break it down in the way that uh, that that works in conversations because my heart is really reaching people. Um, so I'm talking to a friend or my brother or somebody who doesn't believe in God, and and um, my brother's a really good example because he's such a good man. Um, I look up to him in a lot of ways, and he does wonderful work with uh, with students, and uh, actually. Uh, he does a lot of work with students' parents in the inner city of high school students and um, in a company he, he runs called Tech Goes Home. They do phenomenal stuff. Um, and he has a huge heart and a good man. Anyways, um, so I'm talking to him one time about the existence of a moral law. He was actually visiting here. We were standing outside in the parking lot outside of my church. And uh, we're getting into it with each other and we're of the same stock. So we like to argue and we get loud with each other and we have a lot of fun with him. He's my brother, so I don't really have to worry about offending him. So it's great. Uh, he's always going to be my brother no matter what, which I love. So uh, so we're, we're, we're talking back and forth and, and uh, about the moral law. And he's arguing that it all comes from it's a societal it's a societal construct, right? Um, it's a it's a social contract ultimately speaking. And, and, I, and then I'm trying to break it down for him. I'm bringing up moral reformers, dilemma, and these other things. And just not landing like I was hoping they would. So I said, hey, Dan, let's pause the conversation here for you. And let me give you an example. So uh, my brother, just so you know, a little backstory is he's, he loves the environment. He's like kind of environmentalist. He's vegan, uh, like hardcore vegan, doesn't own anything leather, won't buy a leather belt or shoes. And like, it's crazy. Uh, Anyways, this is important for the story because I, I'll, I tell him, let's let's pause this for a second. I just want to shift gears for a second and let you know that I want to invite you right now to a wonderful vacation that I'm putting together with a bunch of my friends. We, we go up to Lake Arrowhead, which is a huge lake right by here. And um, <clears throat> hey, Tim Phillips, Tim Phillips is in Malaysia. You're amazing. Really good friend. It's so good. This Well, I don't see you, but it's so good to have you here. Um, I pray for Tim and Ardina, his wife, and they're doing amazing work and uh, pray for them if you can. Anyways, I don't want to tell too much about what you do. Um, so anyways, uh, so so I'm talking to my brother. I'm saying, hey, come to Lake Arrowhead with me. And it's like five or six other buddies. And and uh, what we like to do is we fish and we stay up late and we smoke cigars and we talk. And this is a really good time. There's Christian and non-Christian there. So it's not like this weird, you know, cult thing. Where we're going to indoctrinate you or try to get you to do something you don't want to do. Um, it's a lot of fun. And, and I said, the best part of the whole weekend is, is, is that what we do is we go in the town and we buy a 50 gallon drum of sulfuric acid. My brother kind of, what, what do you mean? What do you do with that? And they say, well, uh, we, 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 we rent a boat and we row out to the middle of the lake. And what we do is we, we bet when we dump all this sulfuric acid into the lake, how many fish will it kill? And the person who, who, who gets closest to the number of fish that the acid is going to kill in the lake gets to keep all the money. And it, it, it's a fantastic fun. It's a lot of, it, it's a lot of fun. It's a fantastic time. You might want to come. And when I say this, my brother is like, she's like steaming. He's like, you can't do that. You cannot, you cannot do that. You ought not do that. You shouldn't do that. That ain't right. And right when he says that, I say, well, what do you mean that ain't right, Dan? Because if it's all up to a social contract, I have, I live in an area where we don't care quite as much of, about the environment as you. So our social contract, at least for the weekend, is to kill all the fish. And it, it's a silly example. And it's one actually I got from JP Moreland years and years and years ago. But it proves a point. And actually, even in this instance, when I was talking to my brother, he said, well, that's a pretty good point. Let me think about that, which is fantastic because there's the stone in the shoe that I'm always looking to do. <clears throat> and, and, and ultimately, in the end, guys, evolution, um, uh, you know, the, the only way that a naturalist can explain reality, I mean, morality in reality is either through evolution or through social contract. And, and both of them, in the end, ultimately end up in uh, relativism. Um, so, and, and I just don't have time to get into that right now. I kind of want, I don't want to keep you guys too long. And I just want to kind of get into the last bump, uh, within the, the short time I have, and then we'll call it quits. But, um, and I'm really appreciative of you guys hanging in there this long. Um, this one is more of an existential, uh, an existential crisis I had. Um, Listen, I don't, I don't wrestle with depression. I don't less wrestle with um, lack of meaning in my life. I never have. Um, I've been always a fairly confident, like normal guy. Um, so I just want to stay that because uh, 
when I started thinking, when I started, um, I started really searching for meaning and purpose as an atheist, uh, man, it led to some, some really hard things for me. Um, you see, I think that our souls hunger for, for deep, deep purpose and meaning and, and ultimate significance and, and unconditional love and, and, and unconditional acceptance. And I think that like, there's so much to talk about on this. In fact, I don't think that we talk nearly enough about the existence of our souls and, and, and their nature and, and how much, uh, that ex- the, the reality of the soul drives so much of the stuff that's going on in culture today, that the, the need for acceptance, the need for love, um, the need for meaning, and it manifests in different ways for people who deny the existence of soul. Um, and I don't, I just don't think we talk enough about it. And I'd like to wrestle maybe just with five or 10 minutes with you guys on it. Um, because it's from the soul that we derive consciousness and, uh, our consciousness are that we are conscient conscious beings, uh, is a huge part of reality that that oftentimes we don't wrestle with. And I think that that's a, that's a mistake. We should be wrestling with this stuff. And I think it's a huge problem for the atheist. Um, and, and again, it's not a huge problem for the Christian. Um, our worldview entails this. It, 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 it has explanatory power when it comes to the existence of a non-material um, aspect of human nature. Uh, obviously, uh, naturalism doesn't have that. Um, and, uh, you know, the Daniel Dennett, he's famous for saying, you know, consciousness is an illusion. And, uh, and I think that that actually shows how much trouble the atheist, the naturalist is in, um, you know, because, because what's an illusion, right? Our, our conscious mind is, is being appeared to falsely, um, in a certain regard, that's what an illusion is. But then my mind goes to, let me, let me, let me think about this, uh, the, the, do non-conscious things have illusions? Does a flower have an illusion? Does this does this microphone have an illusion? Well, no. Rocks don't have illusions, just like they don't dream. You know, I mean, um, because they don't sleep. Only only conscious minds can be appeared to. Um, therefore, if if consciousness itself is an illusion, the only conscious things and only conscious things can have illusions. Is, is the illusion having, do you see what's happening? Is the illusion having an illusion? This is a perfect example of a self-refutation, you know, um, just, it, it just doesn't work. Uh, naturalism, this is like, I, I certainly done it when he says stuff like consciousness is an illusion. I mean, I don't know what that's based on, you know, uh, I think Dennett in order to say that has to presuppose what he's denying in order to deny it. Um, and it doesn't make much sense. He, he must, he's got to, he's got to presuppose what he's denying in order uh, to refute it. And it just, it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, Thomas Nagel, um, in this book right here, good book, uh, the mind and the cosmos, T- Thomas Nagel, no friend of ours. He's an atheist out of NYU, I think. Um, yeah. NYU really smart dude. And, uh, the sub, the subtitle to this book is why the materialist neo-Darwinian conception of nature is almost certainly false. And he, and he may basically discusses the existence of the mind, the consciousness, the, the, the non-material aspect of, of human nature that materialism just simply can't account for. Um, you know, and, and why is this so important? Why is this so important? First, the souls are real. Uh, our soul is what we're aware of. Um, when we introspect, when we think about life and ourselves, when we introspect, that's what we're aware of. All Everybody has a soul and, and, and everybody's always aware of their soul because you're constantly interacting with your soul. At every waking moment, you are in, uh, um, you are in contact with your own soul. You know, um, we're not simply meat suits in motion. There's that, there's another component there. How do we know this? I was, uh, 
uh, competitive soccer player. I played in college and in high school and I used to be good. And one of the things in college and in camps, once I got older that we used to do it, I was a goalkeeper is we used to do these, uh, these visualization techniques, um, meditation ultimately. And we did all be sitting in the classroom and you'd have the, the person, the coach leading the meditation and he would say, okay, close your eyes. And, and I invite you guys, if you're watching to do this, and, and this is a great, uh, example of the existence of consciousness, the mind. Uh, he'd say, close your eyes and everybody in the, everybody in the last, in the class closes your eyes and it's visualization, right? So the, the, the purpose of this is to get our minds centered on something. And so the coach would say, okay, close your eyes, imagine uh, a green square. That square turns into a rectangle. And on that rectangle, slowly you see the chalk outline of a soccer field being formed. And now you're zooming in towards that green rectangle and you're zooming in closer and closer and closer and the white lines get brighter and brighter and brighter and you're going in and the green seems perfect and beautiful. And as you're zooming in now, you're starting to see that the green isn't just green, but it's grass. And as you're going closer into the soccer field, you see that the, 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 the grass isn't just clumps of grass, but made up of individual pieces of grass. And now you are so close that you were visualizing an English, a single piece, a single blade of grass. And you reach out and you grab that grass and you touch it. Now you pluck it out of the ground and you rub it between your fingers and you bring it to your nose and you smell it. And you have the smell of grass in your nose. And now you drop it down and let's see it float. Now you zoom out and now you see the pitch again. And now you're out. Now everybody open their eyes. And that's what we do, stuff like that and visualizing certain save techniques and all this stuff in there. But then when I use this for my example in my presentations, when I'm talking kind of a little bit more structured, but talking about this stuff in my talks, I, I ask the audience, I do that experiment with them. And I say, okay, well, now where was, where was that, that blade of grass? Was it closer to your right ear or your left ear is what I'd ask. And of course, there's, there's no, there's no answer, you know, because, because it's not in your brain. There's no physical location. It's, and, and then, so the naturalist, what I would have said as an, as an atheist, I would have said, well, it must, it's just synapses firing, you know? Well, yeah, well, maybe you have synapses firing. You absolutely do, but that's not what you saw. You didn't see the synapses firing. And the lie of identity is saying that if two things are the same, they share all the same properties. Certainly the blade of grass had different properties than the synapses firing in your brain. And get this, the, the, the experience that you had didn't just stop at that, a, a visualization technique. How many people, when you do this, when you seriously do this, you can smell it. You can interact it with your, with your senses. So it's not just this, this, uh, this illusion, <laughs> but it's better than that. There's something going on that's an interacting. It's your soul. It's your, it's your consciousness. It's your mind. You know, you, you, you saw an image of that soccer field. You saw the white lines being painted on you saw the blade of grass where was that image that you can't answer that question you know you, you it's so crazy when you start thinking about these things um it, it's kind of like having the dude i got like i said four little girls 10 8 7 10 8 6 and 3 you guys can be praying for me there's always somebody crying in my house most of the time it's me but uh, but they're beautiful kids. But they are they're totally into these Disney movies, these princess movies, and I get these movies, the songs stuck in my mind. They're not stuck in my brain. If you cut my brain open, like you wouldn't see lyrics of of Rapunzel flowing all over the place. No. But if you ask me to to sing a song right now, it's Rapunzel twenty four seven. It's uh, oh man, what's the name of that movie? The Rapunzel movie, Tangled. I got those songs stuck in my mind, you know, stuck in my mind. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing, the second reason why I think that the soul and talking about consciousness is so important is um, oh man, this is something I love so much guys, because there's something so special about human beings. I would have agreed with you on this as an atheist, even there's something that makes us special. Um, but just as an atheist, I just didn't understand what that something was. You see, it's the kind of soul that we have that makes us special. We all know humans are special. They're valuable. That's why we gas termites and not Jews to bring it back to our Auschwitz example. 
you know, uh, the value of a human being, it's not, it's not found in anything, anything physical. That's why ethnic cleansing is so bad. That's why we're repulsed by slavery. Injustice is done to human beings. That's why, uh, that's why this, all this social justice stuff is out there is because we recognize wrongs to other humans and we, and we know it's wrong. And yes, there's that moral component, but then you get deep down. Why is it that we're not equally uh, upset when, when, when we, when we, uh, you know, like, we, like when we kill all the ants that are coming into our house during a rainy period or, or when, when, you know, uh, when, uh, you know, a, a certain um, animals have to be euthanized. It's because they're different. And the thing that makes us different from them is the soul. Value is, isn't placed on anything physical. Size, level of development, it's all the sled stuff, right? Environment, level of dependency. This is why abortion is so wrong. It's because we have souls. We're soulish creatures, and it's special. We're made in the image of God. And when I was wrestling with this, and again, this is just my experience. I'm not using this as my apologetic. This isn't my argument for, the, for, for why the Christian worldview is valid. It's just my experience here. When I was wrestling personally with these things as an atheist, I couldn't explain to you why humans were valuable. The only thing I could fall back on was that we were more uh, highly evolved. And when I really thought about that, again, dropping my presuppositions, guys, I, I really struggled. Because it seemed to me like the world around me wasn't that way. It seemed to me I knew that humans were special. You see, part of the existential crisis that I went through was that, that my naturalism, my atheism reduced human beings to cosmic junk, ultimately biological accidents, product products of, of time and, and chance and random mutation. We were just physical parts, you know, stuck together without any rhyme or reason. There was no purpose in it. You know, um, if you guys have, a, I don't know if you guys have ever seen uh, Ben Stein's documentary, Oh man, on, on upper education, sugar. I can't remember it, but if you've ever seen it, he interviews this, this, uh, professor, William Provine, who's uh, now dead, a really smart guy. And, and, and he says this, and, and he's, he's at least honest when he says this, he says, he says, let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary biology tells us loud and clear. And these are basically Darwin's views. There are no gods, no purposes, no goal-directed forces of any kind. There's no life after death. When I die, I'm absolutely certain that I am going to be dead. That's the end of it. That's the end of me. There's no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning in life, and no free will for humans either. What an unintelligible idea. You see, on atheism, friends, on atheism, man's nothing... And his life means nothing except uh, except any maybe, except any meaning you might bring to the table. But that's arbitrary. You know, it's the move of the existentialist. It's, you know, on, on naturalism, nothing is ultimately valuable. Nothing is ultimately meaningful. Nothing uh, will ultimately satisfy. Nothing's going to satisfy our, our hunger, our need, our desire for purpose, our hunger, our need, our desire for justice, our hunger, our need, our desire for immortality. Our immortality projects are popping up everywhere, as Clay Jones says. You know, nothing ultimately matters on atheism. And this is, this is what I mean. I had an existential crisis because I was living this stuff out. I was wrestling with it in real time. And it became very clear to me why why they they called this worldview or uh, they call it uh, not not atheism or, or naturalism, but that quickly it very leads to a worldview that's called nihilism, nothingism, because nothing matters. 
And let me let me just let me just tell you that when you start believing nihilism, when you start believing nothingism about human beings, uh, bad things, bad things start happening uh, very quickly. You know, uh, lately I've been lately I've been talking about suicide um, all over the country, and, and that's been a topic at Stand to Reason that I've been um, I've been preparing for and speaking on and. I just got to tell you, friends, as you're watching this, worldviews matter. You know, our worldviews, they, they, they inform us about who we are in an ultimate sense. They, 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 they lend to us our meaning, our purpose. Um, there are real consequences. So anyways, the, the, the first thing that we know that is that we have a soul and, and um, it's the only adequate way to, to explain consciousness. You know, this, the second thing we know is that humans are, are special. Um, the third thing... Um, everyone knows, and, and this is so poignant and, and, and a great time to say this right after Easter, uh, humans are broken. Uh, and I'm not saying that we're physically sick um, or, or, or impaired. Some of us may be, but, um, but we're morally, we're, we're morally broken. Um, and, and, and more specifically, we're more, more, we're morally to blame, you know, um, You know, and I remember when I was coming to coming to Christ, when 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 Jesus got a hold of me, this bump, the bump of me, the bump of the soul, the bump of consciousness, the bump of the mind, uh, shook me to my very 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 core. Because because in a very real way, my conscience at that time was re reactivated. Um, I'd allowed my naturalism, my atheism, to numb me in certain ways to certain aspects of my lifestyle and when your conscience is reactivated and you're in the midst of uh of chasing immorality uh that is a hard bump <laughs> it's punched to the face <laughs> and that happened to me and, and and the only explanation for it is is that my worldview was bankrupt you know naturalism uh Naturalism not only had no explanation, but it had no no solution. You know, I used to I used to bring up all the time the Christians, and and, and this this brings us back to the beginning of my story on on that first Easter when I was talking to Rihanna, um, showing her that that cartoon mocking Jesus. You know, I, I used to bring up to the Christian, I bring up to Rihanna all the time, like, um, you know, why did why did why did why did your sky daddy have to have to murder his son? This this cosmic child abuser had to kill his his son. But then when my conscience was reactivated, when 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 God got a hold of me and I had this serious existential bump in the reality, the bump of me, I I, I very quickly realized the answer to my question: Why did God have to kill Jesus? Why did Jesus have to die? Well, because of me. Because of me. Because because I'm broken. Because I'm morally bankrupt. Because even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for you, is the way Paul puts it. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might, listen, so that we might become the righteousness, the righteousness of God in him. When I realized that, it was it was game, set, and match. It was over. My, my, my most potent objections to the Christian faith, when I dropped my presuppositions and I allowed uh, the, the answers given to us by science and philosophy, and then, and then I allowed the weight of the scriptures to, to crush me. At the end of the day, my naturalism... Uh, couldn't explain it, and then you and then you combined it to to answering my, my my ultimate question: Why did Jesus have to die? And the answer is me. Natural naturalism couldn't do it. couldn't Couldn't explain it. The had no explanatory power. It couldn't explain this part of reality. Naturalism can't explain uh, the, the beauty and the, and the wonder of human beings, and it has no answer uh, for human brokenness, and, and it has no consolation for, for true forgiveness. So it, 
can't be true. You know, Christians do though. Christianity, Christianity answers these things. It offers forgiveness and consolation. It has an answer to human brokenness. It has a solution to human brokenness. And it tells us why Christians are valuable. You see, as, as, an, as an atheist, all I was left with were my own, my own devices. And, and Bertrand Russell, uh, for me, describes this quite well when he says that, um, that all we have as naturalists is, is the firm foundation of unyielding despair. That's where I found myself. And that's why, anyways... I think that's why we see suicide rates climbing. I think people are getting more and more desperate. Um, but even as an atheist friend, even when you're not a believer, you you know better. You know, I knew better. And um, in, in my unguarded moments, I, 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 I would let that slip because I had to live within reality, right? I had to live within the way the world really is. And when I bumped into those things in reality that were outside of the explanatory power of, of my naturalism, I would have to yield to them because reality is not gonna yield to you and me. So I'd have to bump into it, you know. Um, you know, a while back, and I'm gonna close with this, but a while back, I was having a, um, I was having a, a conversation. Actually, I had a seven-year ongoing debate with one of the attorneys I worked with at my last law firm, and uh, and, we're, and we used to talk all the time. He'd bring up all his questions about the resurrection and Jesus and, and all this stuff, and I did my best to answer him. And he had great questions. He's a really smart guy. I mean, this is a partner at my law firm, one of my bosses, and and uh, and I'd be having these conversations with him. And it was towards the end of my time at the law firm. It was late at night. We were working on a, a case, a trial that we were going to, and. We're sitting there and I remember it was dark outside and I, I used to like working in dim light. So my, my lights were kind of half off and, 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 and he asked me another question and I give him an answer and I say, Hey, Greg, can I ask you one question? You've asked me a lot of questions over the years and, and I've tried my best to answer them. Can I ask you one question? When you're alone in your house and the lights are out, when you're safely under your covers, your wife is asleep and so too are your children. Do you pray? And he looked at me and he's an atheist and he looked at me and he says, you know what, John? I do. I pray. And I said to him, well, now it's up to you to figure out who or what it is you're praying to and why. You see, friends, we're built a certain way. We're made to worship. It's just who or what are you worshiping? And he went from atheist to agnostic over seven years, which is a, a, a leap. It's only a short step from agnostic in my mind to, to theist. So hopefully I'll be able to continue, um, continue on that conversation with him outside of uh, the law firm now being with Stan Reason full time. Um, so anyways, guys, uh, these are, these are the bumps that I had in, in, in my life and I hope they were, organized enough for you guys to glean something from them. I see that I've gone an hour and 17 minutes, almost an hour past what I wanted to do, but such is life. Uh, it is an absolute privilege to be able to do this um, with, with not only Stand the Reason, but with you guys. Um, I don't know if you know this, but Stand the Reason is largely supported um, by you, by, by, uh, by partners, financial partners. And, um, we're so grateful uh, for your, your steadfast support and love. Uh, even during times like this, COVID-19 defined times. But um, I'm so grateful that I had the opportunity just to share a little bit of my story. And I'm thankful for you and grateful for you. If you guys have any questions, feel free to, uh, feel free to email them to me. And I'll do my best to respond. You can just private message me uh, and friend me on Facebook if we're not already friends. And, uh, and I'd love to interact with you guys and, um, yeah, guys hang in there, you know, contend for the truth, ask good questions, but hold people to the fire. Cause, cause, cause as Christians, we have, uh, we have the benefit of reality. 
reality is our ally because it's the Christian worldview that I think best uh, explains the world around us, the way the world really is. And um, we have the hope that everybody's looking for. So anyways, God bless you guys. Um, I'll see you. Well, I don't know when next time I'm going to be live Sunday. I'll be live with uh, Tim Barnett and Alan Schleeman doing our book club on tactics. If you guys haven't been watching, that's at six o'clock my time, that's Pacific time. And Wednesday at one, Alan Schleeman is going to be doing hermeneutics, uh, you know, teaching, teaching us how to read our Bibles better so we can be better Bible readers, which we all need. So tune in there. And uh, other than that, guys, I'll see you when I see you. God bless you guys. Stay safe, stay healthy. And I praise the Lord for y'all. Have a good one. Good night.